Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Binder. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about uh, testability. Uh, the title of the talk and uh, well, the general structure of it have changed a little bit from the uh, what's in the announcement. So, uh, but don't be worried; it will be uh, pretty much the same uh, content. Just the story is going to be told in a somewhat different manner. So, what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit first about why testability matters, or at least why I think it matters. Uh, look at two dimensions of testability from a kind of high-level perspective. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to call them white box and black box. Uh, talk a little bit about the role of test automation and what it plays in terms of uh, testability. Uh, and then uh, try to draw some conclusions about strategy uh, and how we go about the process of uh, doing testing, designing tests, running them. And then uh, I think we'll have some time at the end uh, for questions and answers. So why does testability matter? Basically, I look at the testability from an economic perspective. Uh, let's start with a few assumptions. In software, sooner is better than later. Uh, bug escapes are bad. Fewer tests, uh, again, other things being equal, uh, means more escapes. And in testing, we have a fixed budget. Uh, so the question is, uh, given a fixed and finite amount of resources, of course, I don't know, maybe Google, maybe things are different here. This is the, uh, perhaps, uh, but, but uh, seriously, I think that uh, in most circumstances, we have a, a project with a deadline and a finite amount of time and uh, resources, uh, ability, hours in the day, people, et cetera. And so the question becomes, how can we put that to best use? And in terms of testing, the, the issue with testing is we want to uh, contribute value by improving, removing uh, defects from the system and perhaps some of the uh, knock-on effects, the secondary effects of that, that that often happen from doing good testing. So for me, testability is basically the thing that defines the limits on uh, our ability to produce a complex system that has an acceptable risk of costly or dangerous defects. There are two uh, dimensions of testability, effectiveness and efficiency, which I'll come back to uh, later on at the, towards the end of this. But this basically, if you look at the total cost of doing a test, uh, and that's all the resources that are consumed in doing testing, you divide that by the number of tests, for me, that's the average efficiency. And when I look at this, it's not just the, the time that you might spend first writing a, uh, a test object and a mock for your, your source code, it's everything that you have to do afterwards. Uh, that somebody else might have to do uh, or can't do because of uh, uh, the way things have been done. And effectiveness is the average probability that when you run that test, you'll find a bug. Hopefully that's low, but not zero, at least starting out. So, you know, other things being equal, higher testability means more better tests at the same cost. Lower testability means fewer weaker tests at the same cost. What makes a system under test testable? Uh, classically, there are two dimensions to this, controllability and observability. This goes back to hardware engineering, digital logic design. Uh, hardware guys started working on the testability issues a long time ago, uh, especially uh, this, sort of this was driven by uh, increasing miniaturization. So when you went from LSI, large scale integration, to VLSI, very large scale integration, several order of magnitude more, uh, circuits on, on a uh, piece of silicon, and then now to the sort of, uh, you know, nanoscale uh, wires that are in uh, the computers we're all using, uh, you know, you couldn't just stick a probe in it, right? The wires are too small. It wasn't like, you know, the old breadboard where you had everything exposed and hanging out. So in order to determine what was going on within a circuit, you had to have a way in which you could controllably uh, observe what was going on inside of a system. Uh, and uh, to make a long story short about this, there's a whole standard for this. It's called the JIT or JTAG standard. There's on every, basically every chip that's made, there are four additional wires that come in and out of it that allow you to do testing. Uh, so the idea of controllability and observability, at least from my perspective, they have this kind of roots in uh, hardware engineering. Controllability means what do we have to do to run a test case? How hard is it? How expensive is it? Does the system under test make it impractical to run some kinds of tests? There may be questions that we'd like to ask. There might be a scenario we'd like to evaluate. 
because it's likely to occur in the real world. But it may be that in our test environment, that's prohibitively expensive or just technologically infeasible. I'll give you some examples of this later on. Given a testing goal, um, do we know enough about the system, its behavior, and its likely environment to produce a test which is realistic and meaningful? Now, you might say, well, well sure, How's that, how hard can that be? Well, if you think about it, let's say our testing goal is that we'd like to cover all the requirements of our system, have one test for each. Well, sort of that presupposes that you actually have requirements. Now, how many of you have ever worked in a system where you had a full set of requirements? Yeah. So uh, the knowledge that we have and what we begin to approach our, our testing with and what we drive our uh, design of test cases is really a factor in testability. And how much tooling, by the way, can we afford to achieve controllability? So these are all kind of factors that, that influence this. Observability has kind of a, a symmetric relationship. What do we have to do to determine what, whether a test has passed or failed? Again, this may seem simple. And when you're, we're talking about you know, straightforward unit testing, where everything is kind of on your desktop and under your control, and it's a nice, uh, well-organized sandbox, uh, you know, it's not so hard to do. But the testing that uh, I'm sure that many of you are involved in, large distributed systems, uh, it's not quite so simple. And again, the questions are, how hard or expensive is it to achieve a particular kind of testing? Uh, and does the system under test, such as the way it's structured or, or designed, make it hard or easy to do this? Can we easily find uh, the, the information we need to determine whether a particular situation has occurred or not? And do we know enough to determine uh, pass, fail, or did not finish? Here's a fishbone chart that I first produced about 15 years ago. I got interested in the subject of testability for a number of different reasons. The story is not terribly important. Uh, anyhow, uh, so I looked at all the factors in this, and this is kind of what I came up with. Now, for those of you that don't have, you know, 1,000 by 1,000 vision, here's the short form. Uh, testability, at least in that initial uh, uh, analysis for me, had six basic factors. Uh, each of them had a lot of separate uh, individual uh, things that were drivers. Today I'm going to focus on, basically on uh, representation, implementation, and to a certain extent, test tools. Now, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about process, uh, how the test suites are organized. I'm also going to talk a little bit about built-in tests. Uh, this is there's an article in this. You can read it at your leisure if you like. The reason that I put this up, the takeaway there is to say that testability is not a sort of single, at least in my mind, is not a single dimensional issue. It, it's, it's really, there's a whole uh, um, web of, of uh, forces and factors that uh, uh, influence whether or not a system in your particular context is testable. Let me give you some examples from personal experience of uh, systems that I've worked on and the issues in controllability and observability that I've had to wrestle with in trying to create tests for these systems. Well, GUIs. Everybody deals with GUIs sooner or later. It's basically impossible to test a GUI other than manually interacting with it uh, without some abstract widget set and get. Uh, if you do happen to have one, you have a commercial tool such as uh, uh, you know, HP's uh, uh, Windrunner or something of that nature. Um, or, or a Selenium, uh, if you're using a, a, a web interface. Uh, it's great, it does a lot for you, but it's also brittle. This is the curse of capture replay. Uh, we all know what the headaches are involved there. Uh, latency is another interesting problem. Uh, latency in terms of the uh, response of a system and also the think time that users uh, impo impose in terms of doing real interaction. Our testing uh, usually isn't very good at capturing that. So it's a controllability issue. We may have a hard time actually uh, dealing with the variations in response and think time. Dynamic widgets. By that, I mean widgets which tend to define themselves on the fly. And then things that are very specialized for which uh, our abstract uh, setters and getters don't really, <laughs> can't really deal with. Uh, observability. Uh, not everything is as simple as a, a text, uh, text box where you can set and get a string and figure out whether the string says what you want. Uh, there's structured content, there's lists and all sorts of things. And you know, this needs implies some kind of notion of a cursor. 
Uh, and that's not just the tester. Uh, it's a position within the uh, uh, data structure. So can that be established? Can it be manipulated um, to get something out of interest? Uh, there's a lot of noise and non-determinism and non-text output. Graphical output is, is notoriously difficult to parse. You can't parse it as text. Uh, there are some very interesting and, and uh, uh, successful attempts to uh, extract information meaningfully from uh, you know, basically a bunch of bits that represent a picture. But it's still a hard problem, I think. Uh, image recognition uh, as uh, testing. I looked at this and a few years ago, and it's uh, a lot of interesting research proposals, but nothing was uh, immediately a takeaway, at least as far as I know. And then there's plenty of proprietary lockouts. So testing GUIs, you know, it's controllability and observability, even with the tooling set that we have, there's a fairly large industry that supports this, you know, it used to be close to a billion dollars a year. Um, it's still not that great. Uh, one system I worked on, we had to basically drive a lot of exceptions out of the operating system. This is a Unix uh, platform. Uh, there are hundreds of exceptions that the system uh, under test could throw. Uh, and the, the issue for us was whether or not the application that we were testing could actually catch them and do something reasonable with them. Well, we had to generate them first. So how the heck do you do that? You know, how do you force exceptions? There are certain things that were kind of... Uh, difficult to get to. And then another interesting issue in observability in this case was silent failures. So if you could force the exception, oftentimes, you know, the application just says, yeah, I don't care. So we really had no way of knowing, perhaps other than just the absence of a response, whether or not uh, something had actually occurred that was as expected. Uh, my first exposure to object-oriented programming was back in the Objective-C world, the so-called next world. Uh, a very interesting experience. Uh, Objective-C is a highly dynamic language uh, in which it was, it was common uh, uh, programming practice to define objects on the fly, to, to define the classes for those objects on the fly. So programs had this, this sort of feeling of writing themselves. Well, that's, that's very interesting and uh, it also creates a lot of headaches in terms of testing. Because you don't know what you're testing, what the testing target is, how to evaluate it, and whether, you know, it's uh, remotely close to what you want. And then these things tended to sprawl out of control. So the source code that you looked at was nothing like what the actual implementation was. <clears throat> there was a problem of trying to instrument objects on the fly. How many of you have worked in uh, with mock objects in, in a system that has a DBMS or it's a database or large data store behind it? Okay, so, you know, as they say, how's that working out for you? Um, this sometimes can be quite uh, challenging. Uh, we may just want to take a little bit of a piece of functionality away from a database uh, for our, our particular application. It may turn out that you know, writing the mock object in some sense is, is, uh, is a project uh, of similar complexity to constructing the database management system itself. A uh, system I worked on a number of years ago was a multi-tier Corby application. And we had a real challenge getting all the distributed objects to a particular desired state to achieve a particular test. So this was, this was what I, I referred to as, uh, I, I tried to describe the problem to people in my family who were not software, uh, you know, and really didn't know much about it and didn't want to. And I said, well, it's like this. Suppose you were, you know, you had a, a dog act. You had six different dogs. You wanted to get them all up on the, the stage at the same time uh, perched on a little chair and, you know, balancing a ball on their nose and then barking out, you know, Merry Christmas or something like that. Uh, it was comparable to that. So there were lots of issues in controllability there. And then we had some other interesting things that went on in that in tracing message propagation. So when you have distributed systems, message propagation, and figuring out what happened at all the points in the path is quite a task. Another system I worked on was a cellular base station. And this was kind of the ultimate non-testability. Uh, a base station is essentially, it's a big radio tower. And uh, the physics of radio transmission are very hard to emulate. So you can't easily, you can kind of fake it out, but there are certain things that happen uh, that are not easily emulated. So basically, the best place to test the cellular base station is to take it out in the field and have you know, 10,000 people pick up their cell phone and try to make a call. Well, uh, that gets to be ridiculously expensive, 
And by the way, the customers who are paying for the base stations want the people who make the calls and not get them disrupted in the process. Uh, there are also lots of proprietary lockouts in this and sorts of other interesting things going on. The systems are never offline. So the point here is the controllability and observability have some very real uh, dimensions uh, in uh, uh, lots of different kinds of systems. I'll talk a little bit about some of the dimensions uh, that, that come to us from uh, the implementation. Things that drive uh, complexity or drive uh, testability in the implementation are complexity and uh, non-deterministic dependencies, what I call NDDs. Things that help us are points of control and observation, built-in test, state helpers, and good structure. And by the way, I'm not going to claim that this is an exhaustive list, but it is what I'm going to touch on today. Um, And just to give you some sense of what, um, what things you have to pay attention to. Before I do that, go much further into this, I want to introduce just a little bit of theory about testability. And I hope I'm not uh, taking away from what uh, another speaker uh, later uh, who basically uh, uh, helped to uh, define this theory uh, uh, some years ago, Jeff Offutt, uh, will say. But, to reveal a bug, a test has to do with several things. Several things have to, happen, have to line up. You have to get the, the buggy code to execute. You have to trigger the bug in that code location. And executing a picture piece of code, even if it has a defect in it, does not necessarily mean that it fails. When it does fail, we have to propagate the incorrect result to something that's observable. There has to be an observer of the incorrect result. And uh, the incorrect result must be recognized as such by the observer. So you say, well, yeah, gee, that's all kind of obvious. Well, in a sense it is, but it's, uh, there's some kind of interesting uh, uh, takeaways uh, from this. Uh, here's a, a, a trivial fragment of code. This is an example uh, devised by uh, Jeff Bose many years ago. And here the bug in this is that, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that I used to do all the time. Uh, you know, a wrong operator. So I should have an addition instead of subtraction, but I didn't. Anybody want to guess uh, what the test cases would reveal this bug? Suppose you didn't know that, so no cheating. What test would you have chosen to exercise this method? Well, it turns out that we could do exhaustive testing on this. There are about 65,000 possible inputs. And those are the only three or six, uh, is it six? Yeah, six uh, test cases which would reveal this bug out of those 65,000. And if you'd chosen one, the number one, uh, which is kind of an obvious choice, and a lot of testers said, well, it's, no, we should at least do that. Uh, sorry, you wouldn't find the bug. You chose zero, well, you're better lucky. You have you're better luck there. So uh, this is a kind of very low level notion of testability, but it's an important one. It's where uh, basically the idea is what is the sort of propensity of code to hide bugs? In other words, when, it, when it's wrong, how easy is it for us to determine or write a test that shows that it's wrong? And th this example is somewhat contrived, but it's one that, that indicates that uh, there, there are plenty of very simple circumstances where the answer to that is pretty darn hard to get those, to find those, those problems. So what can we do about this? Well, we'll come to that later. Here's another one. Uh, I couldn't find any good dancing dog pictures, but I did find this one of these uh, dancing hamsters. Somebody really got busy with Photoshop on this. It wasn't me. Uh, this kind of suggests to me what uh, these, these sort of non-determinist dependencies are. Race conditions, these are classic ones. Uh, message latency, uh, threading, all the wonderful things that can happen uh, when you use threading in your applications, and uh, create, replace, update, and delete the typical operations, unshared and unprotected data. Sort of all the stuff that used to happen before we had databases, and sometimes still does. So these are basically things that we have that are hard to control in an environment, and an application may allow or rely, even rely on them. Uh, they tend to be things that uh, can cause failures intermittently. 
Another kind of key element of uh, testability is the extent to which our systems are complex. Now, <clears throat> software complexity is a subject which has lots of people have said lots and lots of things about. I'm not going to get into uh, too much uh, detail today, other than to say it is uh, kind of critically important for testability because the harder it is to get to that each of those points in the code, uh, the less likely you are to get there and the less likely you are, therefore, to see the bug. There are two kinds of basic complexity, essential and accidental. Essential complexity is, it's basically, you have a big job, you have a big system. So you can't get away from that. Accidental complexity is what kind of gets dragged in, usually kind of uh, coincidentally because of technical decisions and commitments. There's a great analysis of this uh, called essential systems analysis that uh, uh, was published a long time ago and made the same uh, kind of distinction. Usually we see some kind of graph diagram or other, other way of representing complexity. I thought today uh, you might like to see a somewhat different one. Well, This is uh, a well-known uh, modern artist, Jackson Pollock, uh, who did uh, some very interesting things. I, I find in looking at this picture, I don't know what your experience is, but as I look at it, there's something about it that draws you in. And that my experience in kind of looking at it and being drawn in is that I can't quite figure out what it is. And then there's a, a sort of uh, uh, a, uh, an echo to that somehow. Well, without getting too much further down that path, by the way, the music that I chose is one that illustrates kind of complexity and uh, compositional structure in a similar uh, vein. So uh, I thought the, this might uh, suggest that complexity is, is kind of a psychological phenomenon and testability in our, in our uh, ability to understand things and then construct tests uh, from that. So think about Jackson Pollock the next time you think about complexity. What improves testability? Uh, points of control and observation, state-based uh, uh, test helpers, built-in test, well-structured code. I'll talk a little bit about each of these. What's a PCO? Uh, if you're familiar with something called TTCN3, uh, this is a notation, an abstract uh, notation for uh, test uh, strategies and uh, test harnesses for protocol verification. And basically, within it, it has this notion of point of control and abstraction. And that's uh, an abstraction for any kind of interface of interest. So what do we do have to do as testers, basically, to activate a component and an aspect? Hmm. We know what components are. What's an aspect? If you, well, you may have heard of this. It's a notion that says there's some slice of functionality within a system that may not, be, that may not map cleanly onto a component. That's an aspect. These are things actually that quite often we're interested in testing. Uh, aspects usually are more interesting, but are usually not directly controllable. So for example, performance, the ability of the system to respond or its, its rate of consumption of resources is an aspect. There typically isn't one interface that you need to touch uh, to evaluate performance. What do you have to do as a tester or creating your test harness to inspect the resulting state? Traces are one way of doing this, uh, but they're often uh, not sufficient or, or noisy, at least traces that are designed uh, for other purposes besides testing. Uh, embedded state observers, which I'll spend a little bit of time uh, kind of sketching for you this morning, uh, are often effective, but they can be uh, kind of expensive to do, and uh, some people complain that they're polluting. So aspects are often critical, but typically not directly observable. So our design for testability, this is like going back to that large scale integration where I can't put a probe into a, you know, a wafer of silicon that has a, a nanometer wires in it. Um, design for testability is to determine uh, the requirements for aspect oriented points of control and observation and build those into your system. So ask yourself in advance, as you're doing the system, what are the aspects that I care about, my customers care about, and how can I observe those, and how can I put something into my uh, design which allows me to easily evaluate those? 
One thing along that vein might be state-based test helpers. I was very interested in this subject a number of years ago and, and, and wrote some, uh, uh, and collected some patterns about doing this. Now, basically, to do state-based testing, you need to do several things. You need to be able to set the state, uh, get the current state of whatever it is you're testing, uh, and then use something that I've called a, a logical state invariant function or an LSIF. You also typically would find it to be useful to do a reset, which means to take the system under test back to some starting state. All the actions and events should be controllable and observable. What does this look like? Why are we interested? Here is a uh, implementation model of a uh, part of a system that uh, supports a three-player game, uh, two-player game, three-player game of, uh, of a racket, uh, racket game similar to uh, racquetball or uh, tennis or squash. Uh, the bottom uh, is the uh, state chart that might result uh, when we uh, show what to do for uh, the three-player game as an extension of the two-player game. The test model is somewhat different. The test model is we, when we want to test three-player game, we need to uh, consider the aggregate behavior, uh, not of just this individual unit, but of the, the entire unit. So that uh, takes us to producing a test model that's called a flattened machine. So a flattened state machine looks like this. And it takes into account all the interactions. Now, we can then produce a test plan for this. There are many strategies for doing this. This is one that uh, I like. Uh, and what this does is basically it, it traces out all of the round trips within the state machine, uh, where, which will take you from one state and then uh, to another, uh, back to the same one. If we have k events and n states uh, with logical state invariant functions, that's basically k times n tests on the order. So it doesn't explode, which is good, right? Uh, if we don't have any logical state invariant functions and you really want to know what the resultant state is, so that is, at the end of the test you say, okay, I did this, I did this, I did that, and then is that what happened? Did I get to the player two states uh, served? Is that actually what, what occurred? The scheduling of processes and management of resources uh, to check all those things. So they had a, a real controllability, observability problem. The strategy was to add for, into every class in the system an invariant function. They called it sanity checking. The invariant function would basically call another function, which was globally allocated, uh, to determine whether or not the state uh, the conditions, uh, the invariant conditions of that particular object were met. Uh, invariant check could be had some very simple global settings, uh, one of which was that it could be um, the number of times that it actually fired and spent the CPU cycles to do their, to do its checking could be scaled from basically once in every 256 times it was called to always. So you could have a way of kind of randomly sampling uh, as, as the system stabilized and you wanted to dial that down, uh, you wouldn't have to check everything. Uh, perhaps in earlier, uh, earlier releases when the things are still unstable, you do relatively more checking. And then there is a, a kind of a clever trick, which um, some of you may, may use. Uh, it's a combination of constant inline. This is a C++ idiom, an idiom which uh, basically causes no object code to be generated without any changes to source code. So, because this is a ship product and they didn't want to leave the instrumentation in when they shipped the actual operating system, but they didn't want to futz with the source code because uh, the, the risk of reducing or introducing regressions, uh, this is a very clever strategy. We actually took the same strategy and built it into uh, the system that I most recently worked on. Uh, it was a test automation system. We used this and it was uh, quite effective. The percolation pattern uh, basically is designed by contract for class hierarchies, and this is a way of enforcing compliance with something called Liskov substitutability. And that simply means that uh, anything a base class does that subclasses should do only less of. Uh, if you implement this kind of with a no code left behind, you have a way in which uh, you can uh, be sure that with these additional functions uh, that uh, the, it's kind of a check, a runtime check on the consistency 
of the uh, extensions to the class hierarchy. So you can do some pretty sophisticated things with built-in tests. Uh, the, the issue here is, of course, uh, uh, you know, is it worth it? Uh, when you put the effort into built-in test, you put it in once, and then it, it's there, and it works. So I would say that uh, when you have uh, uh, the opportunity to do things like this, it's, it's at least worth thinking about. Well-structured code, this is a, a subject uh, of which uh, you know, there's, there's a lot been said uh, about this, the many well-established principles. I won't uh, delve into that. There are several that turn out to be fairly significant, in particular for testability. Here's one, no cyclic dependencies. This is a cyclic dependency is where A calls B, B calls C, C calls A. That's a cycle. Those are bad, don't do that. Why? Uh, in terms of testing, it means we have to basically take all three of those parts, everything within the scope of the cycle, and test it as a unit. And then doing state set and get on that to bring the, something that participates into a cycle to a particular state may be difficult. Uh, there's an idea called levelization. John Lakos has a great book about this. Uh, I recommend that too if you're doing C++ development. And basically one of the takeaways from that is to not allow uh, static dependencies to leak across functional or uh, package boundaries. So something that uh, is, performs a, a, a function at, uh, let's say, one level of the stack should not reach up to another level of the stack through a static compile time dependency uh, and make it do something else. And then this, this is one uh, which uh, is kind of general but really very powerful for testability is to partition classes and packages to minimize interface complexity. So as you're de designing, deciding what goes into where and what the facade is and what it looks like, uh, and you have several alternatives for that, uh, choose the one which minimizes class complexity. All right, so that's a lot. Uh, let me ask you, there are, uh, I could, Maybe I'll just uh, take a, a, a moment here and take if there are any questions at this point on what we've talked about so far. Sam? Bob, you haven't mentioned security. That's right, I haven't. And, um, I'm, curious. I'm curious how you increase control and observability without increasing attack surface from a security standpoint. Uh, I think this is a trade-off, and it, my, I don't have a good answer for that. I think you necessarily increase it. And so it is like putting in a, a back door, and if somebody else, you know, the bad guys find out about it, they'll probably break it in and, and do something. So it's, it's definitely a concern. That's one of the trade-offs that's involved in doing this. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, this is Ramesh here. Um, so, um, at least in my experience in terms of testability, uh, there are very good points and thoughts. Uh, most of the time when we do, uh, when we think that we have done quite a lot of, uh, like, you know, improvement in the testability, uh, the time we measure, we always realize that, like, you know, still there is a long way to go. I'm just wondering whether, is there anything covered in the slide that's going to be there in terms of how do you, Say, for example, you talked about the uh, states, right? I I'm sure uh, we all would design a test assuming that most of the tests are covered. But some of the transitions which you would have not thought about it, later on you realize that you have not covered at all. So is there a, a way of finding these? Because the challenge itself is like, you know, we always assume that we have done a better job. But then we realize that there is, a ch there is something new to it. We have never even thought about it. Um, so uh, how do we um, um, find these? Uh, uh, well, if I understand your question, you're, you're, you're saying, uh, you know, how can, how can we have confidence that our, our test suites or test strategies are, are complete? Yeah, and also is there any measurements which you could uh, always suggest as saying, like, you know, uh, these are the, we generally talk about uh, the code coverage, uh, the condition coverage, and uh, some of these. Um, is there any, and sometimes we always say, the code coverage is fine, but we are not able to achieve, like, you know, a better condition coverage and things like that. So do you have, do you have anything uh, which, would, which would add more value to the basics what we are talking about? Uh, 
uh, something we could we could also explore more. Hello. Yeah. So uh, th this uh, the question is uh, uh, what um, uh, what kinds of additional criteria might we consider uh, beyond uh, 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 code coverage metrics to help us uh, have confidence that our, our test suites are, are complete? Uh, there's there's no end of coverages. So, you know, if you want to go and invent some new ones, you know, be my guest. The whole point of coverage is to take a, with, with respect to a particular testing goal and say how much of it have we done? How far, how close have we gotten to that? And what, why do we have testing goals? Well, because we have some intuition or a suspicion at least that that is related to finding bugs. So underneath every testing goal is a, a, uh, an assumption that says, I think if I look under this particular rock, there's more likely to find, we're more likely to find bugs. Uh, so I would say it depends on the particular kind of system that you're looking at. If you want to develop more specialized kinds of criteria, you should look to that system itself and things in it that you were uncomfortable with or that you're not certain about or where, you know, you said we're putting this thing together, we'll do the best that we can. We had to punt on this one. We don't know. Uh, you know, so if there are areas where, uh, you have a either subjective or proven uh, uh, risk, known risk of, of higher uh, subjective assessment of uh, likelihood of a problem, uh, I would then ask a question, how, what can we do to try to identify problems given that assumption? And then go after that. So make up your own coverage criteria. All right, I'm gonna get back into this. I wanted to just kind of change the pacing a little bit here. It's a lot, a lot of stuff. One last question. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, so I think you started out the definition of testing as a uh, economics definition. I think what you just alluded to is it's all risk uh, assessment and how much time you have. Uh, there's no magic thing to that. I'm sorry. Say again. What's the question? Oh, it's just a comment. A comment. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just supporting your uh, testability as a economics. Right. It's, it's, it's in engineering. If you're, if you're an engineer and you don't like talking about money because money's dirty, uh, then you can just say it's trade-offs. So you've been gotten an absolution there. Okay. Uh, black box testability. Uh, factors that uh, decrease this. This is looking at a system from an external perspective. Uh, sizes, nodes, variance, and weather. Weather. What the heck is that? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, test model, Oracle, and automation. Again, I don't, don't claim that this is the complete inventory of the things to think about, but it's, it's ones I think that will illustrate some of the uh, things to think about. System size. So in terms of the, the kind of uh, all the technical, interesting technical things about systems we can talk about that to drive testability, one that often I think is not often mentioned is how big is it? Because a huge system, obviously, is going to take more work to test. And in my economic perspective of what testability is, that means you know, if I assume I have a fixed amount of resources to do it, other things being equal, I'm going to be able to do less testing. So the larger the system, uh, the more complex it is, the less that basically intrinsically lowers its testability, from my perspective. All right, so how can we scale systems? There's, there's many, again, many, many metrics you know, choose, choose the one that you like best. Uh, here are some fairly common ones that are, are well understood. Uh, use cases, uh, singly invocable menu items, a command, subcommand structure. Another one is computational strategy. Some systems have, uh, you know, most of what they do is sort of visible at the, uh, the boundaries. Some systems, most of what they do is, is, is hidden away. So if you look at uh, transaction processing system, that's mostly visible at the boundaries. If you look at something like simulation, uh, I worked on a, um, for a large oil company, a reservoir simulation system, which uh, uh, created huge uh, uh, finite element models and did uh, lots of uh, mathematics on that to basically uh, simulate the behavior of underground oil and gas water uh, reservoirs. Uh, it just chugged away for weeks and weeks and weeks. It got maybe 100 uh, parameters that started the simulation going, and then it ran, and then you know, several weeks later, uh, you got either a report 
or in some cases a picture of what the things looked like underground, or at least what their best guess was. Most of the work of that was in what was going on in those computations. Video games are another interesting area where it's kind of the surface of that uh, and how you size those is, is, uh, has its own uh, uh, unique uh, dimensions. Another way of sizing a system is storage. Uh, how many tables, how many views, what are, those, what are the things that we put into it and look at? What about the extent of the network? How many independent nodes do you have to get going? So that's how many dogs do I have to line up on the stage and make them bark out you know, jingle bells? Uh, client server systems, that's simple, it's two, okay. Uh, at least two, and maybe a lot more depending on what I want to accomplish. Uh, N tiered systems, of course, we can have uh, division of labor across uh, different kinds of uh, servers and computers. And then we have peer to peer systems. This example is from uh, one that I worked on recently. It's the, uh, uh, basically an explanation of the Microsoft implementation for uh, two phase commit. And it takes five computers to do two phase commit. So in our test lab, this is actually fact, not fiction, in the test lab, we actually had five computers uh, that each performed those roles. Uh, if you want to get a little more formal about this and you like, mod like modeling and mathematics, uh, you, know, you want to find the minimum spanning tree, or at least one minimum spanning, or uh, one. You want to find the minimum spanning tree, and you must have at least one of those online. So if you're devising a large network system, and you have lots of nodes that have to participate, and you have allocated functionality across those nodes, well, what does that imply for testing? It means that you're going to have to have a lab where you have each one of each, at least. Variance. This is another dimension of, of the test problem that often is not uh, paid a lot of attention to until, <laughs> until uh, you know, several weeks before you have to ship. How many configuration options are there? Configuration options, something usually you set once, the user sets it, set it and forget it. But there's you know, lots and lots of them and uh, there are many possible interactions, many things that can go wrong. How many platforms are supported? How many versions of Windows uh, will this run on? Uh, does it run on the Mac? Does it run on a, uh, uh, you know, which, which flavor of Linux? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. How many localization variants do we support? How many additions for commercial or competitive uh, mar marketing purposes? Each of those is a combination, and each of those can have interaction effects. Anybody who's been in the commercial software world knows that if you don't test this stuff, you will, <laughs> you will pay dearly. Uh, combination coverage, uh, one, way, one strategy for picking these combinations is to do what's called uh, pairwise testing. That basically means to try to be sure that you do each one with the other at least once. So it's not a bad strategy. Actually, it's very powerful in terms of finding bugs. Uh, worst case for pairwise is basically a product of the size of the number of options. So if you have five options of five, that's basically 25 tests. At least. Uh, there are a lot of very sophisticated pairwise selection strategies that try to compress that uh, without going into that. Uh, the number uh, can be reduced uh, with uh, some good tools for choosing the, uh, the pairs. But this is another element of system testability and size. Weather. What I meant by weather was environmental stuff. Stuff that is, is the real world of what your system has to operate in and you have all you can do is complain about it, but you can't control it. Uh, the cellular uh, example I mentioned earlier, cellular base station. Uh, we really uh, uh, had to struggle in that circumstance to find ways to adequately load the system without basically fielding it. By the time it got fielded and the customer had paid for it, because each of those cellular st stations was about 10 million bucks each, at least, uh, the customers wanted to use them. Uh, they didn't want us to test them. What about an expensive server farm? I think uh, Google as an organization knows a lot about big expensive server farms. Let's say you have one that's going to support a certain uh, kind of demand, a certain kind of computing. Are you going to basically have a second one that you dedicate for testing? Uh, 
or do you share it somehow? Suppose there are competitor or aggressor capabilities which are part of the real world that you and uh, your system is to be deployed in. Uh, how easily can you replicate those in your lab? If you're trying to do anything in cyber warfare, this is an interesting problem. The internet, of course, uh, the way that I think of this is like you can never step into the same river twice. In other words, it's a little bit hard to get recreate, uh, to recreate uh, the circumstances when you're dependent upon uh, variable, uh, all the vagaries of uh, uh, network uh, communication. And suppose, of course, that you have, you may, you may not have experienced this. I have a, a few times where there is no test environment. Uh, I worked uh, in an early version at the, what was then called the Chicago Stock Exchange, and putting in one of the uh, early floor trading systems. And there was only one computer, basically, at the exchange. And during the day, that ran the existing stuff. And we couldn't shut it down and, and run our apps on it because there were literally billions of dollars uh, riding on this machine. And if it hiccuped, you know, there was, <laughs> there was a lot of grief. Uh, so we had the test from basically, and then by the time everything was wrapped up after the end of the trading day, it was 10 o'clock. So we got the test from about 10 to 4 a.m. in the morning. You know, and just like uh, Cinderella's uh, 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 coachman, the uh, mice, uh, we had to be out of there and had to have the system clean so it could be rebooted uh, for the production run in the, uh, in the next day. And there were actually some times when, surprisingly, the test system did something bad and uh, you know, there was some, uh, some very tense moments in getting that system brought up the next morning. So uh, there, there are circumstances where uh, the production or field test uh, production or field system must be used for test, and uh, the kinds of things that you can do uh, are limited. You can't stress it. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do in mobile testing early on, we went to some of the test vendors and said, look, we've got this great tool for you. We're going to put it on, on the air, and it's going to saturate your cell tower. <laughs> they said, no, you aren't going to do that. So uh, this is what I mean by environmental factors. And this varies, of course, from one system to another, but it is part of the dimension of testability. So other things being, being equal, a larger system is less testable. You spread the same budget more, uh, you get, and it becomes thinner. So here we, let's say, uh, here's some hypothetical case. Uh, 10,000 feature points, six, six network nodes, 20 options, five variables each, and it only can run from 9 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. How big is that? It's big. I don't know if the correlation here is exact, but I, I did some, some, this is the M66 galaxy, and uh, one pixel in this picture is about 400 light years. And the distance across the solar system, uh, best estimate is, is about uh, one four hundredth of a light year. So it's big. But you know, if you start to think about the number of states in a complex system and the number of combinations of things that we have to test, Pretty soon you get up to astronomical numbers. So while uh, the comparison is, is somewhat uh, for dramatic effect, it's not entirely specious. The other uh, element of black box testability is understanding. What do we know? How much do we know about a system? What's our primary source of knowledge of the system that we are testing? Is it documented? Is it validated? or is intuited or guessed, or perhaps it doesn't even exist yet. If you want a good uh, place to start in terms of uh, requirements at least, uh, there are many standards and guidelines for this. IEEE 830 is a good one. It's kind of old, it's fairly simple, uh, but I still think it, it uh, provides a lot of useful guidance. So how do we know what we're gonna test? How do we know what our system is supposed to do besides just guessing at it? Have you ever had the circumstance where you go into a room of other developers and you think that you know what the system is supposed to do and so do they? And after talking for five, ten minutes, you get this kind of queasy, uneasy feeling like, what the hell did they just say? Or something to that effect. And then 
after about a half an hour later, everybody leaves the meeting and you know, something, uh, something dramatic may happen. But uh, we've known for a long time that uh, getting this shared vision of a complex system is essentially the biggest challenge in software engineering. You get a room full of people, 20 people, working on something extraordinarily complex and difficult, and they all have a picture in their mind. I can guarantee you it's not the same picture. It may be mostly the same, but it's not the same. And then as, as testers, we try to say, well, which picture is right? Which one should I believe? The tester then takes that and produces a test model from that. There are many different kinds of test models, you know, and different strokes for different folks. Uh, uh, I think having a test model of any kind is better than having none. Uh, test models may be formal, they may be informal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one distinction I like to make is, are they test ready or are they kind of hints? A test ready model is one in which you can commit to code uh, or is already in code and you can produce tests from. Or you can evaluate tests against. And then finally, do we have an oracle? And I don't mean the database company. An oracle is, a, is basically something which allows us to determine whether or not a test result is as expected or not. In model-based testing, which is something that I like and I do a lot of, uh, it's, you know, it's relatively easy to produce tens of thousands, millions of tests uh, automatically in a matter of minutes. Now the question then becomes, but if I run those tests, what happens? Can I decide whether the results of running them are actually as I want or not? And if I can't, the tests are not very meaningful. So do we have an oracle? Is it computable or is it judgment? Sometimes the best that we can do, and oftentimes in circumstances, uh, it's a good strategy to have uh, a person interact with the system and then judge, decide whether or not the system makes sense. Finally, let me say a few things about test automation. I'm a big believer in automation. Uh, I know there are other people in the testing world who are big believers in, in uh, people. I believe in people, but I believe in computers for certain things. Uh, people are, uh, computers are better than people in certain kinds of testing tasks. In particular, in bigger systems, we need more tests. Uh, automation properly used, of course it can be misused, uh, gives us intellectual leverage. It allows us to kind of extend our vision and understanding across a very large and complex space. It's repeatable. We can scale up functional tests for load tests and many other kinds of things. There's lots and lots of different kinds of automation. I'm sure that you'll hear about uh, different strategies uh, in this conference today and tomorrow. Uh, I mentioned just a few here. This is far from an exhaustive list. Model-based testing, again, an area of my interest, particular interest, uh, does two things, generates tests, and good model-based testing systems also choose their models carefully so that they can serve the purpose of evaluation also. Finally, why does test automation matter? Uh, this is a, a kind of notional slide. I don't claim that this has any deep research behind it, but it's kind of the way that I look at the world. If we look at effectiveness, our ability to create a system which is reliable, and let's suppose that we categorize this according to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reliability or availability statistics, five nines from one nine. Five nines basically means a system which has about five minutes of downtime a year. One nine is a, minute that, a system that has about five minutes of downtime a day. We look at our other factor of efficiency. Uh, so if, if I can produce a system that is five nines uh, versus one that is one nine with the same with a testing strategy, I would say my testing strategy is more effective if I can achieve higher reliability at the same cost. Uh, productivity, this is kind of the total cost of tests uh, per hour. How many tests per hour or per cost or whatever your, your uh, unit of measure is uh, can I do? And my experience in manual testing, uh, we're in this region to where we can get probably about two nines, so a system that will run for several weeks without burping seriously, uh, and we're going to get on average about one test an hour. And I take into this my, my experience in total cost of testing, not just the first time that you write the test, but when you come back to it later and you have to maintain it and fix it or throw it out and start over. 
So it's kind of the total cost of that along with everything else. So if you took all the, the inputs, uh, economic and otherwise, uh, that's what I'm talking about here. Of course, uh, any, any reasonable tester uh, can do more than one test an hour, but I'm saying that on average, that's about what it ranges. With scripting, uh, both uh, of the kind of uh, GUI capture replay as well as uh, unit-based testing with the uh, various uh, test frameworks, uh, we can get about an order of magnitude better productivity. And in my experience, this, this helps us find other things being equal, uh, about another notch up in bugs. My own experience in creating model-based testing systems for specialized purposes uh, puts this up, I, I claim, and I, ha I do have some data to back this up, that uh, we're able to achieve uh, two orders of magnitude better uh, productivity uh, in terms of number of tests generated per our economic cost of producing them, and at the same time, the tests were much more uh, intensive, broad, and reached into parts of the system that we could not have done uh, or imagined as, uh, as kind of uh, doing uh, simply manual or uh, let's say traditional kinds of testing. I worked on for the last several years a model-based testing vision, which uh, unfortunately is incomplete, but uh, my intent was to take this, because this had a lot of, whoops, had a lot of uh, kind of uh, hokey limitations. I did what customers wanted, uh, so I, I you know, was on their nickel and uh, uh, didn't do all the things that I wanted. But I believe that model-based testing properly understood can get us to uh, some, uh, what might seem to be kind of fantastic levels of efficiency as well as effectiveness. So the kind of test automation that you have is a factor in your testability. What this, this, the takeaway from this chart for me is that as systems scale and complexity and difficulty of testing, they're getting bigger, they're not getting smaller, right? Nobody's systems are getting smaller. It's, it's, we've got an expanding universe. If we stick with strategies like this, basically, you're gonna run into more problems than you want. You're gonna run, run out of resources or you're gonna produce systems that are unnecessarily buggy or unacceptably buggy. You won't be able to keep up. Talk a little bit about strategy. So what's the bottom line? How do we improve testability? Well, for white box testing, we've seen that there's several things that we can try to improve. Uh, Built-in tests, state helpers, uh, PCOs, We'd like to try to maximize those and minimize the corresponding uh, blockers of testability. With black box, the same thing. We'd like to maximize our ability to produce meaningful models, evaluate the results, and have a harness that helps us do that. And we'd like to minimize all that other stuff. Okay, so that's not very profound. The thing that's of, in of interest to me is that who owns these factors in most organizations? Now this may not be true in yours, so if, and if it's not, that you should think yourself uh, lucky. But in most organizations that I've worked with, the fact is that testers don't typically control or own the work that drives testability. The things that drive testability are basically uh, dictated or handed to them by the architects or the people who are uh, managing the system and the developers. Testers are basically working on uh, the test parts and this is determined by someone else. So the things that kind of uh, set the bounds on, on how effective you can be often are outside your control. So this is kind of a whole process and organizational issue. It's a whole other subject. I'm not going to attempt to discuss that, but it's something I think you may want to reflect on. And if your circumstance is not like this, again, I say, consider yourself lucky. So here's a strategy box finally at the end. Let's suppose we're in a circumstance where we have uh, high black box testability and low white box testability. My argument is we should emphasize functional testing or black, a black box approach because we can't really do much on the white box side. So the implementation might be, this might be a legacy system which is old, hard to test. What should we do? Okay, let's not kill ourselves. Let's go for the low hanging fruit. Oh, pardon the expression. Um, emphasize functional testing when that is the thing to do. Because if you think about the alternate strategy to try to dig into the code, you know, it's a losing battle. You can burn a lot of cycles, burn a lot of time and money and not get very far. 
Symmetrically, kind of the other thing is true when you have uh, high white box testability, you have a, a, a system that is, is cooperative, well structured, uh, but you might not know much about its behavior. For example, a system that is relatively new, something that's just been through development and beta test, first time. Uh, you might want to emphasize uh, uh, implementation specific uh, aspects of it. Getting back to the question that the gentleman asked there, what kind of things might we know, might we be, um, should we pay more attention to? It depends on what you expect to go wrong. If you're in a circumstance where you have low testability on both, both counts, I think your best attack is to learn how to manage expectations. And then finally, if you are in a circumstance where you have produced a system which is, you know, works kind of high, uh, it has achieves high testability both in the implementation and representation sides, I think you ought to try to figure out how to do it again. Because uh, the news here is that you've done a tremendously good job. You've done something that's unusual, unique, and you ought to try to figure out what, what the magic was that made it happen and put it in a bottle. Okay, so that basically is my story, and uh, to take questions, I think we might have a little bit of time. I haven't run over too much. Yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Rizwan. You mentioned something about the uh, uh, testing in the production environment. So how do you manage uh, the strategy for testability in terms of performance, in terms of load or stress testing? Do you do some like... Uh, capacity planning or estimation, you do a prediction and everything based on your knowledge in the white box testing and black box testing. How do you do that uh, in advance? Uh, it's a little hard. That's, that's a, a kind of general question. It's, it's sort of hard to answer in general uh, without knowing the specifics. Um, you know, I think you just have to look to the trade-offs and, and decide uh, what, what makes sense and what, what's uh, doable there. It's, a, it's, a, it's negotiable. Other questions? All right, so I have a question for you. When I played the uh, uh, Messer, uh, the M66 Galaxy slide, I actually I had an internal debate about what kind of music to play along with it. And this is something, an orchestral piece, which has some very, very uh, dramatic um, uh, uh, brass in it. I thought that the other thing that might work in that was uh, Jimi Hendrix's uh, Purple Haze. So, I don't know, would you have preferred to hear Purple Haze this morning or, uh, or not? Uh, okay, well, another question over here? Uh, see, one thing that you didn't mention is about the test data. So, a lot of times when we're doing the performance tests and load testing, uh, here I am. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was going through a lot of uh, open questions you're posing uh, in the talk, and then uh, one thing I thought uh, it's relevant is uh, the test data, especially when we are doing the performance load and stress test, uh, when we actually load the databases, uh, you know, when we are required to do that for like, about 40% of the production data. So d my question is, like, don't you think uh, uh, test data is uh, a challenge uh, when we're actually handling uh, you know, the testability and the kind of time? it takes for us to set the stage. Yeah, it certainly is, and uh, that, that's a very good point. Uh, how do you populate and instantiate that, that setup? Uh, yes, I, I didn't uh, get into that, but uh, in a, a data-intensive system which has a, a large database, um, getting that just to some initial usable state which is consistent uh, can be uh, quite a lot of work. And so uh, it's something that it's, it's worthwhile paying attention to and, and I think uh, automating as well. If you have a model based test, let me say that if you have a model from which you can generate uh, some kind of uh, assume certain scenarios and then generate uh, a database a snapshot that corresponds to those scenarios, unload the database, reload it with that scenario, uh, I found that to be a very useful uh, kind of tool to have in uh, the situation you described. Other questions? <laughs>
Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for, for your attention this morning.